In this video, we're going to take a look at the spreadsheet program, Google Sheets. Spreadsheet programs like this are used across nearly every industry to help manage data. I have the exact same video made for Microsoft Excel, so if you plan to work primarily in Excel, then that is the video for you. Google Sheets is filled with hundreds of tools that can be used to record, analyze, and manipulate data for practically any purpose imaginable. In this video, we're going to see how we can use Sheets to perform some basic statistical functions on a set of data. Let's get started. You can start a new document by creating one in your Google Drive or by typing sheets.google.com into your browser and creating a new spreadsheet. When you first open the program, you should be looking at a blank spreadsheet like this. The spreadsheet is organized into columns labeled by letters and rows labeled by numbers. Each little rectangle where a column crosses with a row is called a cell, and each cell is named by the column and row it belongs in. For instance, this would be cell B4. Knowing the names of the cells becomes important later when we construct mathematical functions within the spreadsheet. The first thing you should do with this spreadsheet is save it with a name and a location. Click the name of the document in the top left corner and change the file name from Untitled Spreadsheet to Your First Name, Your Last Name, and Data Analysis. A nice feature of Google Sheets is that your spreadsheet should automatically save your work as you go. Starting in cell A1, enter your name. In cell A2, write your class block number, and in cell A3, type the name of this exercise, Data Analysis. Now we're going to need some data to analyze. You should have picked up 27 wooden cubes in the classroom. It would be a good idea to number these cubes 1 through 27 so you don't lose track of which ones have already been measured. Now use a pair of dial calipers to measure the length of one side of each cube. Starting in cell A5 and working your way down, type the measurement for each cube until you have 27 entries. Just write the number for each measurement. Don't include units as text or punctuation, or sheets won't be able to perform any math with these cells. If you notice that your trailing zeros are being rounded off, you can get them back by selecting the cell and clicking the button Increase Decimal. This will show one additional decimal place. Now we have a nice data set to work with. In the lesson Summary Statistics Part 1 Central Tendency, we talked about a few different methods of communicating the center of a set of data, including the mean, median, and mode. It turns out Google Sheets has lots of mathematical functions built into the program. Type mean, median, and mode into cells C5, C6, and C7. Now click on cell D5. This is where we will report the mean value of our data set. In your taskbar, look all the way to the right side of the screen. You should see a button with a little sigma symbol, which contains the library of ready-made functions in Google Sheets. Click it and find the average function. This is the function we will use to find our mean. But I want to move past this for now so you can see where the rest of the function library is. A little further down the menu, you should see the word all, which contains the entire library of functions organized alphabetically. Beneath all, you will find a few other headings which contain collections of functions related to more specific applications. Most people using a spreadsheet program will have a handful of functions that they use all the time, and once you know the names of the ones that you need, it's probably easier to type them in by name than to find them in this big library, but you should know where to find them. Hovering over an option shows you a brief description. Go ahead and select the average function. This will prompt you to select a range of cells which contain the data that you want to average. Your 27 data points should be in cells A5 through A31. You can drag a box around these cells to select them, or you can type A5 colon A31 into the field. When you click OK, your mean will be calculated and reported in cell D5, next to the word mean. 
your mean should be reported to one decimal place more than the original data, so if necessary, use the increase or decrease decimal buttons to show more or less decimal places. Go back to the function menu and repeat the process for the median and for the mode. You can search for the function you want by name. Realize that when you search for mode, you will see multiple options. If you use the mode function and receive an error, it could be because you have multiple modes. You can use the function mode.mult instead, which should report the multiple modes if this is the case. Once you have your measures of central tendency reported, let's analyze your data for variation. Part two of the summary statistics lesson covers two different methods for reporting variation in a data set, including range and standard deviation. Leave a space below the mode, then type range into C9 and standard deviation into C10. If you search the function library for range, you'll find that a range function doesn't exist. So for this function, you will have to type the operation into the cell manually. To help, you should use the functions min and max to automatically find the highest and lowest values in your set. Type min into C11 and max into C12. Then use the functions from the library to report these values in cells D11 and D12. If you click back on cell D9, you can construct a custom function to calculate your range. Type an equals sign into the cell. This tells Sheets to perform the calculation that follows. After the equals sign, type D12 minus D11. Don't type the value of the measurements that are reported in those cells, but the names of the cells instead. When you use cell names in formulas this way, it doesn't matter what the value in the cell is. If the original data set was updated to include a new minimum or maximum value, the result of min and max would update automatically, and so would your custom-made range function. If you type the measurements instead of the cell names, then the function is static and will not update if changes are made to the data set. In cell D10, insert a standard deviation function for your data. If you search the library for standard deviation, you'll see a few results. The one you're looking for is stdev.p, or population standard deviation. Select this function and enter the range of cells containing your data. You should see the standard deviation reported in cell D10. Be sure to adjust the number of decimal places to show one more decimal place than the original data. Next, let's see how we can create a histogram for our data to graph its distribution. Part three of the summary statistics lesson talks about distribution and some different ways that it can be shown in graphical form. Before we can create a histogram in sheets, we will need to establish our bins and our class intervals. Take a look at your minimum and maximum values. Based on these, determine a reasonable class interval for your data set that will result in about 10 to 15 class intervals. You might set your class interval to 2, 3, 4, or 5 thousandths of an inch apart. Based on my minimum and maximum values, I'm going to use a class interval of 1 thousandth, starting just below my minimum value. Type these class intervals into one column starting in cell F6. Click Insert, then Chart. You should see the Chart Editor pop up on the right side of your screen. Under the Chart Type dropdown, select Histogram beneath Other. And in the Data Range field, select the Select Data Range button. Select the cells containing your measurements, which should be A5 through A31. Click OK, then click the field Add X Axis, and Select Data Range. Then select the cells containing your class intervals and click OK. Click the Customize tab and the Histogram dropdown. In the Bucket Size field, enter the range that you selected for your bins. Mine was one thousandth of an inch, but yours might be different. Click the dropdown for Horizontal Axis. Type in your highest and lowest bin values. Scroll down a little further and find the Number Format drop-down. Click the drop-down, 
then select From Source Data, even if that option is already displayed. You should notice the values on your x-axis change to reflect the true size of your bin ranges. You're almost there. Navigate through the other menu options under Customize. Create a title for your graph that makes sense in the context of this assignment. Create labels for the X and Y axes that describe what those axes are representing on this graph. Position your graph in the empty space beneath your summary statistics. Congratulations, your data analysis is complete. Now let's see how to export your work for submission in Google Classroom. You're going to be submitting your work in the form of a one-page PDF file. Click File, then Download, and select PDF Document. Carefully look over the preview. It should clearly show all of your information neatly organized on one single sheet. You might need to change the page orientation from landscape to portrait and change the scale to fit to page. If your preview looks correct, click Export. Be sure that your exported PDF file is saved in your Google Drive and that the name of the file is still your first name, last name, and data analysis. Attach your PDF file to the statistical data analysis assignment in Google Classroom and submit it. Don't submit your Google Sheets spreadsheet, just your PDF, as one single attachment. Now you know a thing or two about working with data in Google Sheets. Keep working at it and this program will be one more tool in your tool belt that you can use for years on all sorts of projects.